Okay, so Joel, you're ready to proceed. Okay, well, fantastic. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. So um, most of you know me, my name's Joel. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about uh, machine learning and the frontiers of asthma diagnosis. Um, uh, there's a couple things that are really important is, first of all, what is machine learning? I think we've been talking about it a little bit in this course, um, and I don't say I'm an expert by any, any means, so I'm going to give you sort of an overview of what machine learning is. And then we're going to talk about asthma. What exactly is it? How is asthma diagnosed? <clears throat> and then we got to take a trip down memory lane because it's important to look at how technology has progressed over the centuries. Uh, so looking at some of the um, technologies in respiratory technology and diagnosis of, of respiratory diseases and how it's uh, come to where we are in the modern day and how we can be using sort of a futuristic uh, look into, into diagnosis from uh, the use of AI and machine learning. And then some of the challenges as well and why it's really important um, to, to use uh, machine learning in the diagnosis of asthma. So... I'm going to start off with a, a video um, and I'm going to ask you what your thoughts are after. So pay attention, everyone. <laughs> You've asked about machine learning and we have a watermelon here. You know, you used to uh, go to the store, pick up a watermelon. Uh, maybe your family told you, you push on the end to see if it's soft and that means it's a good watermelon or if it smells a certain way. That's how you tell if it's a good watermelon. Well, with machine learning, you don't do any of that. You basically try to determine all of the attributes about this watermelon that you can, and you take those attributes and you feed them into a baby machine model that knows nothing how fat the stripes are, how thin they are. And, and you, you feed all these attributes into that model, you go home, you eat the watermelon. You come back in the next day, and you tell that model, that was a good watermelon. And it remembers all of those attributes and the fact that it was good. And you're gonna do that every day for the next 10 years. After 10 years, that model is gonna be able to tell you, based on attributes that you give it, if the watermelon you picked up is good or bad. And you may not know why, that that model is telling you it's good or bad. Um, but you can trust that it has done enough analysis and it can tell you a percentage, a surety of whether it's good or bad. That when you pick up the watermelon, give it the attributes, if it says it's good, you can take it home and it will be good. Okay, so that's uh, that's the watermelon guy. And I wanna, I wanna open up, but just shout out what you think was sort of the main takeaway from that video. What did you, what'd you get out of that? Well, certainly that you would be feeding your computer all these data that you observe in the watermelon. And then the, I think the outcome that has the greatest value is whether you decide it, if it was good or bad, right? And then based on many, many, many of those analyses that we learn the machine, your computer will learn and it will, it will uh, ask you for the input in the future, you put it and then it will tell you it's good or bad, right? So as you mentioned before in, in my session, it has to do with the probability, right? How much times it will be good or bad? I don't know. Yeah, Edward, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, it's all about feeding all of the attributes into the model. So it's all about how much data there is and the quality of the, of the data that is present. And actually, Edward, you, you talked about this a little bit in your presentation on, on Tuesday. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is the more data that the computer receives, um, it's able to make more of a finely tuned decision. So for example, if, uh, uh, Taryn, you have a, you have a great... Um, you have the dogs and the cats in the background there. Um, if we're feeding data into an algorithm about whether a photo is a dog versus a cat, after hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe iterations, the algorithm will actually be able to determine on its own if a photo has a picture of a dog versus a cat. And it can do that with incredible uh, levels of accuracy. So if this doesn't excite you, I'm not sure what will, because it really excites me. There's so many applications for this. Um, and, and today we're gonna focus on some of the applications in the medical field and specifically asthma diagnosis. 
So I want to talk about, oh yeah, before I go into asthma diagnosis, remember this guy, this is the watermelon guy. I promise it'll make sense. It'll all come back and we'll switch gears. And um, I kind of made him into a meme. So he'll show up in, in the rest of the presentation. But what is asthma? Well, first off, does anyone have asthma here? No one has asthma. Okay, well, I have asthma. So it actually affects- I have asthma. <laughs> oh, there we go. I can't see all your videos, so. Um, it, it's a it's a pretty common disease. It's a heterogeneous disorder actually characterized by chronic airway inflammation. And it affects approximately 3 million Canadians and over 300 million individuals around the world. So it is a large concern. It has a lot of adverse effects for patients. Um, you know, they, they have to take inhalers, a lot of different medications, depending on the severe, severity of the, of the disease. And, you know, it's characterized by wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, cough, airflow limitation. Uh, it can really be de debilitating um, on everyday life. Um, you know, it poses a lot of, you know, health risks. Um, it poses a lot of burden on the healthcare system, financially, economically, all of that. So in order to understand how it is diagnosed, let's sort of take a trip down memory lane and see how historical technologies have been used to assess lung function. So I'll give any of you $50 if you can correctly guess what this is. Take a wild guess. Spirometer. Oh, <laughs> dang it. Dr. Sol, as you can answer that. <laughs> well, oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I guess uh, I, I owe you fifty dollars, but yet no. it is spirometer. <laughs> um, yeah. So this was actually the first spirometer that was invented in the eighteen hundreds by John Hutchinson. You might be asking what a spirometer is. Well, basically, a spirometer is actually an apparatus that is used for measuring um, the volume of air that is inspired and expired by the lungs. So this, back in the 1800s, this was actually utilized, it was, a, it was a, a mechanical system that had a barrel of water and you would blow into it and it would displace a, sort of a, a, an air filled uh, barrel that would move up and down. And so it would really measure how much air you have in your lungs. Now that's really important because in part, spirometry lung measurements are used to diagnose respiratory diseases such as asthma, COPD, and, and we'll be coming back to, to a lot of these. Um, so quickly, just in terms of two sort of distinctions um, that spirometry can measure. So I'll take a step back. So when you do spirometry, you actually come up with quantifiable measures. So you can have a forced expiratory volume, you can have uh, ratios, um, lung volumes, all of these different quantifiable measures that um, are helpful in determining between obstructive versus non-obstructive lung disease. So in terms of obstructive lung disorders, they are marked by a reduction in airflow and um, it could be shortness of breath in, in, in basically exhaling air. So what that means is that air is still in the lungs after your full expiration of your lungs. So these are really common in diseases like asthma, COPD or bronchiectasis. The second one is reduction in lung volume marked as non-obstructive lung disorders. So this is actually the opposite. It's difficulty in taking air into your lungs. And this is because of a lot of different issues, but primarily stiff lungs um, that can be caused by, you know, uh, um, uh, scarring in your lungs. So some examples are um, scoliosis, um, interstitial lung disease, and neuromuscular uh, causes. So the bottom line here is that Spirometry is not a diagnostic test. You can't just do spirometry alone and say that a patient has asthma. Spirometry is used along with a lot of other clinical history, a lot of clinical, uh, um, uh, I guess, examinations like history. So I'll, I'll get all of that later. Just wanted to make that very clear. So it is really cool to see how um, spirometry has um, has developed over the years. I mean, we started off in the 1800s with um, uh, Hutchinson's original mechanical spirometer, helping, helpful in the quantifiable data. Over the years, we've seen with the rise of technology, it's able to be done um, 
through a computer. So you can breathe through that little machine and you'll, you'll actually get the, the long volumes and everything um, straight to your computer. That's actually, even that is, is a little bit old. There's now way more complicated and uh, technologically savvy instruments that are used in respiratory medicine. And, and so going to the future, there is a huge potential for AI in, in helping and diagnosing patients with asthma. So we can see here, one of the things that Dr. Solaz has talked about a lot in the course is Moore's Law. And, and this is sort of an example of one of the applications of the Moore's Law curve, where we see how it's sort of increasing in its, in its technological uh, improvements over the years. And I think it's, it's only going to increase more, right, when we're, we're moving towards artificial intelligence. So I want to focus quickly on how asthma is diagnosed, because that is really crucial and how artificial intelligence machine learning is utilized in this. So ideally in a clinical set setting, a physician would take um, a detailed clinical history. So they would look at allergy, um, look at family history, they'd do maybe a physical examination. And then based on all of that, they would determine what's called a clinical pretest likelihood. Um, and basically this is, as Eduardo mentioned, is sort of a probability of a patient having asthma. Right? Because a patient could have all of these clinical symptoms, but not have asthma. So how do you sort of confirm that diagnosis is creating this likelihood. So if a patient has a moderate or a high likelihood, then the physician or the respiratory technologist or whatever would then do a pulmonary function test, such as spirometry. And that would give quantifiable data to uh, confirm a diagnosis of asthma. So again, I'm gonna make it really clear that neither uh, clinical history or spirometry data separately on their own can be used to make a, a fulsome and an accurate diagnosis of asthma. So why am I going in this much detail about how asthma is, diagnosis, or is diagnosed? Well, for two major reasons. One is to show you that diagnosing a, a disease like asthma is not so cut and dry. There's actually a lot of variable factors that need to be taken into account. And the second reason is that it is not always accurate. Um, and physicians do get it wrong. Um, physicians are still humans. Dr. Solas, you're a, you're a human. And I'm sure <laughs> physicians make, make mistakes, as you can probably um, attest. Um, but what is the use potentially of, of AI to increase the accuracy of that? Um, well, before we come to that, I wanna actually talk about the, the accuracy of asthma diagnosis. It's actually a larger problem than you might actually think. So when we're talking about asthma diagnosis, there's a lot of research that has been done over the past few years that show that one in three physician diagnosed asthma patients actually don't have asthma. And this isn't just one paper, this is many papers published in top tier journals like um, the Canadian Medical Association Journal or um, the Journal of American Medical Association or the European Respiratory Journal. So there's a lot of evidence that shows that one in three patients who have asthma diagnosed by a physician doesn't actually have asthma. So why is there so much overdiagnosis of asthma? Well, that is a great question. I'm not a physician. And I actually don't know. There's probably a lot of different factors involved. And it, this is actually being studied very uh, extensively. But it's probably partly because asthma, as I mentioned earlier, is quite a heterogeneous disorder um, with very different manifestations, very different um, clinical predictors, and a combination of history, genetics, and, and so many different factors. So are there any questions so far before I move on? Cool. Okay, so um, we all remember the watermelon guy, right? Do you remember what he said? Feed all the attributes into a model. <laughs> so this is the meme for the day. It's a good thing that we actually have a lot of clinical data um, which can be used to diagnose asthma. So the question then becomes, how can we combine all of that clinical 
data, all of those factors, the, the history, the allergy history, the family history, um, as well as the quantifiable testing measures like spirometry, pulmonary function testing in general, and use machine learning to improve the diagnostic accuracy of asthma diagnosis. Well, it turns out there is actually a lot of research emerging over the past couple of years. Um, I didn't realize actually how, uh, how much research there is um, regarding specifically diagnosis of asthma. I know that um, we've talked a lot about in this class um, some of the the pathology examples, um, Dr. Sola, as you mentioned, and how that's evolved over the years. But I want to focus on one study here right now. And this is an act, a really interesting study that actually, uh, it was done last year, and it looked at deep learning and machine learning techniques, uh, specifically deep neural networks to aid in the diagnosis of asthma. So as you can see, uh, on the left, of the, 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 this, this model, there are a bunch of inputs here. So you can see the symptom, uh, the physical signs. In this study, they actually used 10 inputs. Um, oh yeah, back to the, the watermelon guy. He's sort of lurking in the corner saying to use the inputs. So uh, you can see there's a, there's a list of all of these inputs like age, uh, gender, cough, history of wheezing, family history, and then the, the lung function test from spirometry and PFT. So FVV1, the ratios, all of this rich data. And, and so what happens is all of this information is inputted into this complex algorithm where there's a lot of modeling and there's a lot of math and statistics. Um, basically this type of machine, machine learning is a deep neural network, which I'm not gonna pretend I'm an expert on, but what happens is that all of that information will go through and there's many iterations whereby at the end, there's an output, whether a patient has asthma or not. Or not. And again, this is a probability um, for a likelihood of the, the, the patient actually having asthma based on a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, um, iterations that have been done previously. So it's really interesting how accurate this can be. So I just want to pause here and, and ask you to guess how accurate you think asthma diagnosis based on this deep neural network process can be. Just throw out a percentage. I have a question about this. Is it yes. a binary yes or no output or is it a probability output? I believe it's a probability output. Okay, and it's like rounded like 50%? It's rounded up or down kind of thing or? I think so. I, I'll, I'll explain it sort of in the next slide, what, how, they, how, how they did that. But in terms of accuracy, so to sort of clarify, I think, it's, I think they were looking more at the accuracy as a, as a percentage of it being um, true based on, a, a, on an actual diagnosis. And then I think they also used specificity and sensitivity testing in this. But basically, so comparatively, looking at um, a lot of the different other techniques that are used, it's actually pretty high in terms of its um, percentage. So it's fascinating that this paper was actually able to show that using deep neural networks, um, they were able to achieve a 98% accuracy of diagnostic uh, of diagnosing asthma. Sorry, Nicole, I, I meant to say accuracy, not probability. I think I was confusing those two. Um, so in this study, they were comparing it to two other methods. So they were looking at logistical analysis, logistic analysis or uh, supporting a vector machine, which is, again, another type of machine learning. Um, and here that they, they found that the ac highest accuracy was with deep neural networks. So keep in mind, again, that um, currently many papers are showing that a lot of inaccuracy in asthma overdiagnosis is happening. So if the use of deep neural network methods could be translated into everyday healthcare settings, this could be a huge opportunity to improve potentially on other uh, diagnosis. So I want to talk about another review that this was actually pretty recent. This review article was published uh, just three months ago, and they did a very comprehensive systematic review. They looked at a lot of papers and different categories. So Specifically, they looked at 
<clears throat> four major categories in asthma um, in the field of asthma. So the first one was asthma screening and diagnosis. Um, they looked at uh, asthma management and monitoring, patient classification and treatment. But today, obviously, we're focusing on the diagnosis. So to my surprise, there were actually 48 articles that specifically look at artificial intelligence techniques, uh, specifically in asthma diagnosis, diagnosis and screening. Um, here is sort of just an example of uh, seven of the 48 uh, articles, and they, they sort of break it down in, in terms of um, the sample size, what sort of algorithm they use, um, the evaluation methods, the inputs, and in the basically what I want to focus on is that the fact that the performance is very, it seems to be very high in terms of its accuracy and sensitivity and specificity. Um, and it seems to be sort of in the 80s to 90s range based on a lot of the different studies. And I think they're, as they're improving in terms of how they're creating these algorithms, it's uh, potentially going to be um, uh, better in the long run. But again, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting opportunity to to aid in the physician diagnosis of asthma. So what does this sort of mean for the future? Well, there's so much data that, um, and the impacts of just looking at these examples, uh, just in asthma are endless, but it's not only for asthma diagnosis, there's, um, but also within the healthcare system as a whole, um, there are so many different applications. Um, there's so much data that, uh, currently based on a lot of um, computer scientists that are saying that the data that is being used right now is barely being scraped at the surface. There's so much more depth and richness in the data that needs to be mined through a lot of artificial intelligence uh, methods. So the approach of the sort of the technological singularity that we've been talking about for quite a while can actually be used uh, for so much good, as we can see in this next video. Intelligence, intelligence to build a system that's always watching. We call it PALM, patient-centered analytic learning machine. Our vision is to present PALM as the nervous system of this institution. So it's tricky to detect respiratory failure. Respiratory failure can develop slowly and insidiously. So what we have designed Palm to do is that it collects different kinds of information. Someone's heart rate, their blood pressure, their oxygen saturation, changes in their physiologic vital signs on a second by second or minute by minute basis has implications for where they are going. Palm's job is to calculate the risk for the patients to have either respiratory failure or whether or not this patient is at risk of dying. There is an overwhelming amount of data that we have to deal with in healthcare. The only way we're going to be able to analyze it is through the use of machines. So we have found a lot of reasons to work with Intel because they want to not only imagine the future, but also shape the future of healthcare. We are not only using their engineering powers today, we are also using the cluster of servers that's underpinning a lot of technology. It's also having a partner to imagine what is possible in the future. Our algorithm outperforms any similar model that exists. Not only we ended up with an algorithm that can uh, predict respiratory failure, but also it can predict sepsis. We have data that shows that it has decreased the length of stay overall, as well as within the ICU. We see it as the future of healthcare. So again, this is really exciting because it seems to me that the possibilities are endless and there's so much more potential for collaboration between the clinical world and the computing science world. Um, that was actually one of the conclusions from that huge systematic review um, that computer scientists and clinicians can actually work more together in research and that there is a future, um, there, there's a lot of future research needed um, not only just in asthma diagnosis, but also for management, for treatment regimes, um, and also looking at it from the lens of preventative medicine. And the, the systematic review here really is expounding on this fact that AI can be a strong tool and, and 
you know, we've talked a lot about how there's different approaches to AI and the technological singularity, some catastrophizing it, saying that it could be the end of human civilization and others saying that we can use this for our benefit. And I think that this can be for our benefit if we, if we do things right. I think it's clear that medicine and technology must be used together. And it's really important for, I think for physicians um, and healthcare workers alike to utilize AI technology to better their processes and effectiveness. Um, AI also has the potential to really make our healthcare system more economically efficient and um, looking at less expenditures, less expenses, um, less paperwork. I think one of the things I hear from a lot of physicians is the endless paperwork that they have to do and the administrative duties. Um, but it can also act as sort of like a medical watchdog to look out for errors in diagnosis that um, that happen. It's it's only it, it happens all the time. Um, there's also a lot of medical errors that can potentially kill patients. I think some stats show that there annually are an estimated 200,000 people that are killed because of medical errors, and it costs uh, it costs the healthcare system around $1.9 billion annually. So it is a large problem to tackle and an AI is more than just a proper diagnosis, but it can affect the healthcare in so many different ways. So this, this guy, um, Dave, Dr. David Bates uh, really sums it up well in saying that it's clear that clinicians don't make as good decisions as they could. If they had support to make decision, uh, better decisions, they could do a better job. So I think we can look at it as sort of a, um, a complementary relationship instead of an adversarial relationship. And finally, I'll, I'll end off with saying that I don't think that there is anything like a human being. I think the human being is irreplaceable. That human touch is really important. People want a human to human contact. So instead of replacing the physicians, the healthcare workers by technology, we can shift our thinking to see how technology can assist um, assist them, ensuring that the healthcare system is more uh, um, efficient, more cost effective, as the most appropriate and accurate diagnosis of, of diseases, and serves as sort of a second eye, uh, a supercomputer eye that can confirm or point out errors that are are taking place. And this quote, I think. Was, was published in April in, in an article of last year. And I think it really sums it up very well in saying that we firmly believe that the patient-doctor relationship will be the cornerstone of the delivery of care to many patients and that the relationship will be enriched by additional insights for machine learning. And I think that's really the bottom line here is that it is a complementary 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 relationship and that it can be seen as a very positive thing. So I'll end off by saying that I think the future is bright, but the uh, I, I think the technological singularity is not too far as a lot of people have sort of predicted. And there is a time coming where the current wealth of clinical data will be utilized um, to the full extent using the technological sort of possibilities that uh, are available to artificial intelligence. Um, so that at the end of the day, um, millions of healthcare workers globally will be able to improve the care for billions of patients around the world and make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joel. That was really good. I, I have uh, an extension on the, on the second video you showed how the machines would be collecting data of maybe the lifetime of a human mm -hmm. and seeing how if they detect a pattern that leads to disease, they could intervene early. And I remember that in one of our classes with Dr. Pilarski, he said that one of the limitations is that we don't have the servers to collect all that data, all that space of data. So maybe there's an extension also in collaborations with material scientists that could come up with new materials that can 
save all that data for the future and, and you know, for, for using it to predict disease in, in the future. And also uh, talk, touching base on what Nicole mentioned in her, in her presentation, who is the owner of that data, right? And are we so comfortable to let it be shared, right? I don't know. I think that's that's an important thing. Yeah, if if I might respond, I think that's that's a really interesting point, Edward. Is like where do we store all of that wealth of information? And I think I can't remember what video or which lecture this was in, but I think there was a, we had we had a conversation about the idea of the computronium and how we can sort of potentially in the future put information and intelligent data within inanimate objects. Like if you pick up a rock and you look at it, it's trillions of atoms. But if you're able to communicate with that rock and actually organize those, those atoms, you can actually input all of that data of, of all of humanity and all of technology and Again, you, this whole conversation can go towards like spreading the the information, the computronium throughout the universe. Uh, very sci-fi, I think, but it's it's certainly really interesting. Um, to your second point about um, who owns the data, I think that's that's a that's where it's going to be so important to have really strong understanding of health ethics um, and in the in the policy decisions and in the creation of algorithms it can't be separate there has to be the marrying of the two data scientists clinicians and ethicists have to be working together um, you know we, we live in a pluralistic society with different different understanding uh, understandings of ethics and morals but if there is something like this to happen there needs to be sort of some kind of a consensus um, and I don't know maybe we'll never reach that consensus um, but it is it is certainly interesting. I know for 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 uh, in the in the case of certain research that goes on right now, I think with if you're doing research with Indigenous peoples in Canada, I think there's a certain ownership of the data that happens, and I think um, that's that's one example of kind of how that is being carried out right now. And that's a good question. So. I just want to point out, why was this presentation so satisfying? I mean, it, it, it seems like it, it comes to, you know, it, it wraps up so well and so on. Why was that? It's because it suggests that humans will be always needed, that it ends with a human touch and, you know, AI will just make that human touch better and Wow, that's so satisfying. But it's not, of course, actually the long range future because anything that humans do that can be described in words or formulas that is desirable to have happen, machines will eventually be able to do that better than we are able to even touch. I mean, if you take just the, what touch feels like, you know, like you, you, you can make a machine that where touch has been perfected. So it's like so much more trustworthy than human touch and, and, and so much more what the person actually needs, you know. So I just wanted you to realize that in the long run, it, it, this doesn't stop with okay, it will always require a human, that there will be certainly medical situations where sentient machines are actually replacing the human doctor and doing a much better job. And that will come at some point. Um, and I think to sort of add on, there's also like this whole concept of the doctor-patient relationship and, um, you know, whether it's an artificial doctor or not, I think the current research that's available is only looking at human doctors. Um, but it, it is it is an important aspect to this because, you know, there's I think there's studies that show that having a strong doctor patient relationship actually helps in the management of certain chronic diseases. Um, you know, there's this whole 
model called continuity of care. And um, that's, it's really important to, to understand those benefits and, and potentially maybe in the future, you won't actually need that doctor patient relationship. Maybe, maybe you can get that sort of continual check-ins, those, those check-ins through an app that uses AI or machine learning. Um, but I don't know if that's really been studied. I actually haven't, I'm not sure what, what the implications of that would be. So in psychotherapy, where you're sort of pouring out your feelings of things and the doctor is reacting, there are many situations where doing that with an, an app, which talks back to you and comforts and so on, it works better than an actual physician because you, you, you don't feel as vulnerable sharing, you know, your, your private feelings with, with an app. You think you can probably trust it better than you can an actual person and so on. Yeah, and that's not new data. That's like 10, 10 or 15 years old. So, so yeah, it, there, there, there are a lot of things that our knee-jerk reaction is that, of course, for psychotherapy, we would always want to talk to a real person. It just kind of makes sense, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that it seems so logical. It's so satisfying that people need people, you know, and you're like, wow, there's songs about that. And it's really true. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it is kind of true, but there will come a point where um, it, 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 it's, it's clear that uh, there, there will be other non-human entities that can provide you a more satisfying response. Yeah. So that, that you begin with the neural link. Yeah. 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 Certainly. Yeah. That's that's one way in which that might happen. <clears throat> okay, other questions or comments? I just want to say I really enjoyed your presentation, Joel. And it was really interesting because I have asthma and your presentation is all about asthma, but I was wondering a little bit about what you think the f like future technologies in terms of AI, like we talked about uh, that kind of throughout your presentation, but what do you think could be a really good technology that asthma and other medical fields could benefit from? Well, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a broad question because there's probably so many different answers to that. But I think one of the things is sort of putting that emphasis on personalized medicine. And if a patient could just input all of that clinical data, all of that background and that history, and then do those spiro spirometric tests, and then it just sort of spits out the diagnosis, I think that would be interesting. And, and potentially if you could even do that at home with an app or with some device that you could use that could aid in that. Um, Cause I know a lot, one of the issues in diagnosing asthma patients or other res respiratory diseases is um, access to pulmonary function testing or spirometry. So if you go to rural areas in Alberta or um, indigenous communities, they don't have spirometry. So it's hard to actually diagnose these things when you don't have uh, access to the technology. So if there's a way to do that with some kind of some kind of weird technology, um, <laughs> that that is some ideal uh, solution to this problem. There's another kind of humorous way to think about this. None of us thinks very much about our relationship to dirt, right? Dirt is all around us. But like we don't think about it, we try not to think about it. But one of the risk factors for developing asthma is growing up in a very clean environment, right? Not having much, much exposure to dirt. So that that's that's another thing that could be explored. 
maybe yeah. we we all need a little bit of dirt but in the right way or whatever you know so yeah okay any other questions i don't actually know who's going second and third so so have you guys figured that out so any um Kadisha, would you like to go next or, or what's your yeah, sure. I'm okay. I can go next. Okay. So uh, I'll begin. Uh, sharing my screen. 